Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. Is it logical? Considering the notion of powerful knowledge in the teaching of programming. My name is Tim Wilson. Um, I am your host today, and I'm del delighted to welcome Lee Bellis, who I will introduce shortly. Uh, just before we begin, a little bit about uh, CAS. Um, I am one of a team of CAS community outreach managers operating throughout the country. I'm responsible for managing CAS communities of practice across the Midlands and a large part of the Southwest. And we do this as part of the National Center for Computing Education. Uh, this webinar is the latest part of CAS, the CAS Virtual Showcase. We are now into day eight, um, the two week extravaganza of over 50 webinars to, designed to support the CAS community. Uh, a little bit about our speaker, Lee Bellis. Uh, Lee taught maths for 10 years before being lured over to the wonderful world of computing um, <laughs> and by the shift away from ICT in the national curriculum. Uh, six years ago, uh, Lee took on the role of the head of computing at a then newly opened school in Cambridgeshire. He used the opportunity to develop a, success, a successful and ever evolving computing curriculum at Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4. He's currently involved in the roll up, rollout of one-to-one -one devices to pupils at the school and exploring the impact that the meaningful, meaningful use of these devices can have on pupils' experience of the learning process. Until the world changed, uh, Lee was facilitating well-received face-to-face training as part of the NCCE, NCCE CS Accelerator program at Saffron Walding's Computing Hub. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. If you have questions for Lee, um, during the session, please use the question window on the right hand side of your screen to ask questions. Um, as many of you will be aware, we are in a listen only mode. So this is our sole means of hearing from you. So if you have questions or comments, please do use the question tab. Um, if you're looking for it, the top of the window, um, you will see an orange rectangle which can be expanded or collapsed. If you expand it, you will find the questions tab. Finally, if you are using social media, and we actively encourage that, and it's particularly if you're on Twitter, um, please use the hashtag CASVirtual20. I will send you a little message in the chat with our Twitter handles shortly so you can tag us in. But in the meantime, I think that's everything. And I'd like to hand over to Lee, who will tell you all about his talk. So Lee, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Um, well, hello everybody. Thank you um, so much for, for signing in to, to join me in this talk. Um, it's a talk that I've given a couple of times at different uh, locations and it seems to have been received well, so I'm hoping that you will find it um, useful as well. Um, so yeah, the title of the talk, Is It Logical? Um, and considering the notion of, of powerful knowledge and, and where that came from is a few years ago, as you will um, undoubtedly be aware, um, we started talking in education about the uh, the knowledge-rich curriculum that came from um, from Hirsch's ideas, um, and this has been taken on board for, by um, by lots of schools. Um, and also, Michael Gove um, was a big fan, and I think that it drove his um, changing of the um, the public exams in the UK, um, and. How exactly that changed, I don't know. Uh, it seems to be more actually that people have to to know more stuff. Um, for example, in maths, where I used to teach, um, in, rather than being given the quadratic formula, you had to remember the quadratic formula. And it's a really interesting idea about uh, you know how much is that actually beneficial um, to the learning process. And particularly thinking about maths and thinking about um, programming within computing, what does it actually mean to know something? What actually is knowledge? And this is something that that taxed me quite a lot because, you know, is knowledge in, in something like maths, knowing the formulas and therefore being able to apply them without having to refer to something, or is it something else? And in looking at that and thinking about that and wanting to find out what on earth it could possibly mean, um, I stumbled across um, a lot of um, articles and reading about actually logical thinking and what we think of as a thinking process, to what extent does that actually rely on knowledge and specifically um, on the long-term memory. Um, something else that um, made me think quite um, a lot is that we, 
you know, we start off with with scratch programming quite often, or at least primary schools might do, or code clubs, or or things like that. And then quite often, because Python is a very popular um, language in secondary education, we might want to um, transfer across to Python. And what's often surprised me is that pupils can do really quite complex things in Scratch and seem to understand computational ideas um, a lot. Um, but then when they're transferred to Python, they seem to just completely disappear. Everything that they knew suddenly becomes very, very difficult. And I'm just, you know, and, and why is that? So what I want to um, talk about today is why that might be. Um, and I want to think about some examples from maths and also some examples from um, programming. Um, I'm not particularly going to give you any um, wonderful resources or or um, or anything like that. But what I'm hoping is that you'll come you'll come away from this talk with a sort of a, a deeper understanding of how your pupil the, the perspective of your pupils might be coming from, um, and then be able to look at your own resources, your own curriculum, and maybe have a think about why some of the um, ideas that you've used have not been as successful as you wanted them to be or how you could um, make things more successful. So what I'd like to start off with is actually trying to get you to um, see your brain working um, with some, um, some, some different activities I want to do. And I want to start off with, with this picture here, which has appeared on your screen. Um, so this is a, a relatively well-known um, optical illusion. Um, and when there's an audience, I ask people, uh, what do you see? And you get lots of different answers. And what you're probably sitting there thinking is that, uh, well, there's a cube um, or there are rhombuses or there's a hexagon or something like that. And um, one of the nice things of the optical illusion is that what you probably can see, even though they're not there, if I move my mouse pointer, is the lines here. So your brain is filling in those lines and there's very little you can do about it. So they just appear there and they fill in the, um, the, the lines and make it a solid shape uh, without any gaps. In reality, where there's white space, there really is white space. Um, the second question I'm going to ask is, um, what, you know, can you see this cube in different ways? So if you just look at it and think about the different ways that you might, might see the cube or you might want to describe it to somebody else. So um, how might we see this? Well, it, it, you can, when you have cubes like this, which are really just a hexagon with, or, or rhombuses, um, then this bit in the middle here, um, people will usually say that they can either see it as the, the vertex pointing towards themselves or pointing away. And you can, you can sort of shift and in your brain, you can make it be towards you or away from you and shift um, like that. So there's two different ways there of, of seeing this cube. If you think about the picture in itself, there's an, can you, with the circles, is there, is there another way that you can imagine this picture maybe? And if you've no idea what I mean, if I make it yellow, um, that may, might make it a bit more obvious. So at this point, um, what happens is that people often say, oh yeah, that looks like it's a cube in a room or in a box or something, and then the um, the, the slide in front, the white, is actually um, seven holes, and we're looking through it, and we're looking through it into something. And if you couldn't see it like that, the chances are that as I'm describing it now, you can now see a cube in the background with a sheet of paper in front of you with holes um, in the foreground. And what's wonderful about that is that if you didn't see it before, you can see it now. And now that you can see it, um, you can't stop seeing it. it is it is now one of your options and so what I could argue is that actually if you couldn't see it and now I've made you see it and you can't stop seeing it I've actually got more control over your brain um, than you have and that's a very powerful position uh, for me to be in but it also demonstrates that things that we haven't been able to see before once they become part of our understanding of an image or of something else it doesn't go away it's there and if we can harness that then that's really really um, powerful so going back to um sort of how the brain th uh, works and how, how that might apply in in subjects like maths or programming um i came across the work of um daniel uh, willingham and daniel willingham uh, wrote this uh, book um 
sorry, I'm just trying to move my thing so I get the title right. Uh, why don't students like um, school? And it's a really, really interesting book and it looks a lot at um, uh, the different ways that, um, that pupils might struggle in school and, and how we can um, think about them. And so he um, comes up with this sort of simple figure of the mind. So if, and this is super simplistic, um, so we've got our environment, which is coming into our working memory, which is the, um, the site of awareness and of thinking. And then we've got an interaction between the working memory and the long term memory, which is factual knowledge and procedural um, knowledge. And I very um, specifically put, as Willingham does, that as the working memory, not the short term memory, um, because I think making that distinction um, is really important. Um, What's interesting about the um, the working memory is that we often um, you often hear the idea that you can hold up to seven things in your working memory, and there's this urban myth I think that that's why UK phone numbers are seven digits long because that's the most you can um, remember. Um, but there's lots of research that suggests that actually the a number of things that can be stored in working memory is an awful lot smaller. Uh, and it might be even as low as three. And the problem is that working memory is fixed and it can't be improved upon. That's it. So does that mean then that people who can only store a few things in their working memory are going to be less intelligent or less able to do complex tasks than uh, other people? Um, and the answer actually is, is no, because um, you know, intelligence, we, we do know from lots of um, work, and I know that uh, Dweck is obviously quite big on this um, with her growth mindset, um, that intelligence can be seen as uh, malleable. And although we can't make our working memory larger, what we can do is make the contents of working memory smaller. Um, and there's two different ways that we can do that. So we can make facts take up less room through chunking, and then we can also shrink the processes we use to bring information into working memory um, or to manipulate it once it's there. And that's through practice, through repetition um, of doing things. And another thing that, um, that Willingham uh, talks about is the fact that actually um, the brain is really not designed for thinking um, because thinking is very slow an unreliable um, way of doing things. And so when we can get away from thinking, as in when our brain itself decides that, um, we, we don't think, we rely on memory um, because thinking is so resource um, heavy. And so understanding that actually thinking is quite difficult, but if we are, um, but so therefore when we're doing stuff, we're actually relying very much on long-term memory, then we can start to um, get a better understanding of how we might help students to understand some of the things that we um, are doing. Um, and there's two possible solutions to this. So one solution is to make the work easier because it's um, less thinking intensive and easier. Um, but actually, if we can make the thinking easier rather than the work easier, then we're gonna have a much better, um, much better outcome for our pupils. Okay, so thinking about that, I want to demonstrate um, something else. So I'm going to show you um, some letters. And what I'd like you to do is not write anything down, please, but just to look at those letters, because I'm going to test, or you're going to test yourselves, because I can't um, interact with you um, that easily, um, how many of these you can remember. So I'm going to show up very quickly. Here we go. Um, I'll read through it myself. And they're gone. See if you can write down um, as many of those letters as possible. OK, so I hope I've given you long enough to try and do that. Uh, chances are you struggled quite a bit with that. Um, in terms of actually writing down the um, the letters. So let's have a go at, um, at another one. So same idea, can you write down the letters um, and I'll, we'll do that. And they're gone. So can you write them down now? Okay, 
so if I now put these two um, lists of letters uh, next to each other, um, what you can hopefully see is actually they are identical. So they are the same things just written in a different order and the different order has turned them into um, acronyms. So we've got the two X's at the, the top and the bottom and then the rest of them, if we, if we change the way they're laid out, we've got CNN, PhD, FBI, CIA and PGCE. Uh, and so all of a sudden it's a lot simpler because actually the X's um, you can probably just remember and you've only got five things to recall rather than um, all of the letters um, that, that I asked you to recall before. Um, interestingly, um, I, I didn't do it deliberately, but ICI um, appears in there. So quite often people do remember ICI um, from when they're doing it. Um, and the reason why this works is that what you've got is very, very familiar um, acronyms and so they actually take up one slot in your um, in your working memory and so they're much much easier um, to recall and this is a really important um, thing so this is this is chunking it's a really important thing um, to think about when your your brain works um, and to sort of demonstrate that again um, I want to look at um, a piece of research that uh, De Groot did back in 1965 so what we've got here is two um, images of um, a chessboard and actually one of those um, images is part way through a game and one of them the pieces are um, completely random and if you play chess or if you've ever played chess or maybe even if you've never played chess um, you might be able to see that actually um, this the one on the left um, is part way through a game and the one on the right is random because you can that's sort of the formation of the um, of the of the, the pieces so what the group found that when he looked at people who were very very good at chess so uh, we might call them master players um, and then we looked at um, novices or, or weaker players at the game um, the thought processes between the two different types of players were essentially identical um, the difference was that master players, um, although search through about the same number of possibilities, they're good at coming up with the right moves for consideration, whereas the weaker players um, spend more time um, looking at um, thinking about the, the, the weaker moves that aren't going to actually have as, as big an impact um, on the game. Um, but then more interestingly is that he, he did another test and he looked and he asked about um, short term memory. So he, he, get, he presented pictures like these um, and said, can you then recall the positions of the pieces? Can you do that um, on a board? And they were given five seconds um, to, to memorize this. Um, and what he um, discovered was that experts correctly recall the significantly higher number of pieces if the, um, the position of the pieces is taken from a game. However, if the positions are random, there is absolutely no difference between experts and novices. So the expertise, the experience, the repeated exposure is really vital in terms of how you can um, remember and recall um, information. And that's that's really was really significant there. Um, OK, so I'm going to move on to uh, another thing to think about, um, to think about thinking. Um, and another um, idea that's been gaining a lot of traction in education at the minute is um, the importance of reading and the importance of vocabulary um, acquisition. And I know, um, I can't remember what it was, but I know there was a, a longitudinal study done in New Zealand where they looked at um, people from the age of four, I think it was. And from the level of their vocabulary, they were able to actually um, predict their educational outcomes um, much later down down the line. Um, and obviously, um, in terms of vocabulary, um, one of the, the biggest impact is um, your family that you grow up in and disadvantaged families have um, uh, have a harder time um, acquiring vocabulary, children from disadvantaged families. Um, and the powerful thing about vocabulary is that a single word can contain lots of ideas. And if you're able to join those ideas together, you can have a really good um, understanding 
of things. So reading is really, really important. And um, in lots of schools in the UK, um, we're looking at how we can improve people's reading skills, people's vocabulary acquisition. So how does that tie into um, what I'm talking about here? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present you with a paragraph. I'm going to give you time to read it. Um, and I want you to see if you can understand what's going on. Okay, so um, I'm assuming, hopefully completely correctly, that you, everybody who's listening into this would describe themselves as a, as a proficient reader. Um, and I'm imagining that this is, for you, this is quite a complex um, paragraph in terms of understanding um, what's going on. So, it, you know, it, it, even though you can read, it's, it's quite difficult to understand what's going on. But if I just put the title, um, hopefully the entire thing will suddenly make sense. Um, because not only does it give context, and so all the talk about piles and um, and, and facilities um, suddenly makes sense, um, but actually um, what happens when this is done in experimentation is that if you're given the title, actually you're able to remember a lot more from the passage itself because it fits into um, uh, an idea that you're very familiar with that already exists in your long-term memory. Um, and this is really important to think about when we think about um, pupils um, and their reading. So this is um, a graph um, that was done um, in some uh, junior high school students, so 11 to 14 years in, um, in the US. Um, and they found that half, sorry, they, they found pupils where half of the group were um, were good readers and half were poor readers. And that was according to a, a standardized reading test. And what the researchers did was they asked the students to read a story that described half an inning of a baseball game. And as they read, the students were periodically stopped and asked to show that they understood what was going on by using a model um, of a baseball field and players. Um, the, they made sure that everybody could understand individual actions in baseball, um, but some students knew a lot about baseball and others knew um, very little. And so what they um, discovered was that whether the students were good readers or bad readers had very little effect on their ability to perform the task. Um, and if you look at the, the graph where we've got the dark um, blue with good readers and the light blue with poor readers, the poor readers do, do struggle more, but the significant difference um, is the actual um, knowledge, um, whether they had a high knowledge or low knowledge of um, baseball. Um, and so what we can say is that background knowledge allows chunking, which allows for more room in working memory, which makes it easier to relate ideas um, and therefore to comprehend. So there we go. Um, before I go on to uh, the next um, sort of example of of how we might use this. I've, I've been asked to pause periodically if there are any questions. So I don't know if uh, there are any questions that people have put through. Um, no, no questions yet, Lee. Um, a few comments, um, but other than that, no questions. I think people are very engrossed in what you're doing. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, marvelous. All right, well, if you do have any questions, put them in, and I will, uh, I will stop again um, in a little bit. Okay, fantastic. So this is. This is where we are at the minute. So we know that having prior knowledge helps thinking because it, uh, it makes the working memory more efficient. So clearly the more students know or the, the more anybody knows about something, um, then the better they are going to be at performing um, a thinking task involved with it. So I want to have a look at how um, how, how big an effect that has and how we, um, and, and then start to think about how we need to be very, very careful about um, presuming prior knowledge. Okay, so um, we've got um, a, a quite a famous um, psychological um, test here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to read out um, the instructions um, and then I want you to um, think about um, the, the answer to, to, the, to the problem. So imagine you are inspecting a bar each card represents a patron with the person's age on one side 
and their drink on the other. You need to enforce this rule. If you're drinking beer, then you must be 18 or over. Your job is to verify whether this rule is met for this set of four people. You should turn over the minimum number of cards necessary to do so. Which cards would you turn over? So I'll give you a minute to think about that. Okay, so um, maybe, maybe I don't need to give you a minute. Um, I suspect most of you have, have come up with the solution. Um, unfortunately, we can't, I can't ask you what that solution is or an explanation. Um, but what you have probably come up with is that the minimum number that you need to know is the beer, because we need to know how old the beer drinker is. We need to know whether they're 18 or not. 31 year old really doesn't matter what they're drinking. Doesn't matter who's drinking Coke but this 17 year old, we need to make sure that they're not drinking beer. So the minimum number is two because it's the beer and it's the, um, the 17 year old. Okay, brilliant. So we've, we've solved that problem. Um, I'm gonna give you now another problem, which is um, of a similar type. So here we've got some cards here. So each card has a letter on one side and a number on the other. There is a rule. If there is a vowel on one side, there must be an even number on the other side. By turning over the minimum number possible, which cards must you turn over to verify this rule? And this is trickier, so I'll give you a little longer to think about it. Okay, no idea if that's long enough, but I'm, I'll uh, I'll press on with with looking at the solution, and you can be be thinking about it maybe as I'm as I'm talking. So the rule are: um, if there's a vowel on one side, there must be an even number on the other side. So we need to think about this a. A is a vowel. Does it have an even number on the other side? This one flummoxes people, and people think about this um, and often can't decide whether we need to flip this over or not. And the answer is that we don't, because it says if there is a vowel on one side, there must be an even number on the other side. It says nothing about whether there is, um, if there's an even number, whether there needs to be a, um, a vowel on the other side. Um, B is not a vowel, so we don't need to worry about it. But then three, because three is an odd number, we need to check that there isn't a vowel on the other side, because that would break the rule. So we've got these two problems. Um, the answer to this one is beer and 17, and the answer to this one is A and 3. And that's because the problems, uh, not only are the, the answers in the, right uh, the same place, but the problems are precisely the same. The logic behind them is precisely the same. And um, what we find is that um, in uh, test, test situations, about 75% of people get the first one um, correct and very, very quickly. But um, only about 15 to 20% of university students get the second problem correct. And in Wasson or Wason or however you say his name's uh, original study, it was actually less than 10%. So as I was saying before, for the second problem, most people get A. Often people um, think two has to be turned over because that's an even number and an even number is mentioned in the problem. Um, and sometimes people miss three because three is an odd number and they don't quite work out at what the problem's um, asking. So what's this showing is that context, which worked for the first question, um, is not always transferable or extendable to what is essentially the same question. To highlight this, um, this more, um, we've got um, some problems here. So um, this was the, the Learning Decimals Project was something that's done in um, Australia. Um, and what we've got here is a problem that uh, younger students and some older students in schools uh, will often find quite quite tricky. Um, however, um, what we can do is we can um, put a pound sign or a dollar sign or, a, or whatever currency, a euro, um, in it. And all of a sudden, almost instantly, lots of pupils will be able to, um, to do that. Um, now, 
that's great. And what we often do, particularly as um, maths curriculums often um, talk about um, at a certain stage in a, in a math in a in a pupil's journey through maths, uh, they need to be able to um, to work to work with numbers to two decimal places, then we use this as an idea, job done, it's fit the bit of the curriculum that we're teaching at the minute and everything's fine. But actually that may be true, but it may not be true. Because what um, the research has found in the Learning Decimals Project is um, something called uh, monetization um, of uh, decimals. So at, when people are thinking about money, um, they don't tend to think of it as £3.65. They tend to think of it as £3.65. And, and that is actually a very, very different way of thinking. Because if you know that there's 100 pence in a pound, then you can find out how many hundreds you've got. And that tells you how many pounds you've got. But you're actually doing two calculations there. You're actually adding up the, the pennies um, and then adding them onto the pounds. They are two separate things. And the reason that we know that this, um, this is problematic is because if we then extend on to um, three decimal places, not only does this, um, this idea of turning into money no longer work, but it also doesn't help people. And the reason why the researchers know this is because when they asked um, people to um, put two decimal place numbers on a number line, most people were competent at doing that. As soon as that third decimal place was added in, um, people who were able to do two decimal places suddenly weren't able to easily um, position those numbers because they weren't thinking of it as, um, as, a, as a true um, decimal number. So it's really difficult because we're wanting to provide context and wanting to provide context from, um, from people's lives. Um, but actually, um, sometimes those contexts can be um, misleading. So um, sticking with maths just for a minute, um, I want to talk about another area of maths that people um, find difficult, and that is um, pie charts. So here we've got a circle with 300 and um, 60 degrees in it and the problem with pie charts is we don't tend to use them in in normal life um, or well that's not true we don't tend to draw them in normal life we, we might see them quite often and they're they're quite good at um, illustrating um, data or potentially misleading people about the data that you want them to understand um, but we don't do it very often we don't create them very often in, in normal life and often in maths curriculums they will people will see them at, at most once a year so it's you know it's just not something they're used to doing um when we're when we're talking about um doing pie charts then obviously we need to work out how many degrees for each person because if we don't know how many degrees are for each person we can't draw the pie chart we might start off with a, a an easy number like this which is 12 people um, but then we might move on to something like this which is um, 520 people and that 520 people causes a massive problem and there's two problems one is it's just not a very nice number whereas 12 is is quite nice in in relation to 360 and the other problem is that actually um, pupils have been through through most of their schooling when they see pie charts for the first time have understood that a division is when you take a large number and you split it up or you take a large number and you divide it by a smaller number so if we've got 360 and 520 then the instinctive thing to do is to divide 520 by 360 and not the other way around because that's what experience has taught them. So we need to think about different ways of doing this. And um, a couple of years ago, um, when I was teaching computing, and I still had a couple of maths lessons, which was great because it meant I had more time to think about the lessons. I was pondering over, over this problem and I was talking to uh, my partner, who's, who was also a maths teacher, and I asked her if, if she had any really good ways of, of teaching this. And so she told me of, of how she did it and I did it and it was really, really good. So what she said was that she tells a story and I won't go through the full story, but basically there's a there's a chap and he's got a pie um, and he's got 11 friends. Um, and so he needs to, to cut the pie up for himself and for his 11 friends. So he goes off to the kitchen and gets a knife. And then the question that he has to ask is in order to sort out this um, this pie, does he cut up the pie? or does he cut up the people? And um, pupils find that quite amusing. 
but actually what it gives is a really good hook because when you're teaching um, that, every time when you get onto the more difficult numbers, when the pupils are like looking at numbers and they're, and they're thinking to themselves, gosh, which, which of these numbers do I need to divide um, by which, um, you just have to say pi or people and then they get it because they understand that you're splitting up the pi into the number of people, not the other way around. So you're always dividing 360 by something. And it's, when I've used this, it's been incredibly successful um, and pupils are, are able to do pie charts very well. Of course, what then happens is that even though I shared this with other people, um, they don't necessarily use it. And so the repetition goes. And so that idea that was really, really powerful because in later years it doesn't get revisited, it doesn't necessarily stick, and it, it's not necessarily um, necessarily good. But um, it is a it's a really nice way of, of teaching pie charts. So moving away from maths, because this is about um, computing and programming, um, you know we do have ideas like this that are that are really helpful and, and with repetition um, work really well. So I've taken this slide from the uh, NCCE. Uh, one of the CPDs that um, that is delivered, um, and so we've got this notion of a of a variable um, being represented by a box, and it's got the name, and then you've got the value that you put in the box. And we could spend a very long time dis um, discussing whether or not that box is a is a suitable analogy for a variable, but certainly what it is is a really useful reference that can be referred back to when things start to get a bit dicey in terms of understanding what variables are. And I think one thing that we can underestimate about um, pupils experience of variables in things like Scratch and when they um, start doing Python is that quite often uh, variables in Scratch are used for scores or for counting or something like that. And I do wonder whether they pupils view a variable just simply as a label in the same way that you might have um, your football teams with the scores rather than you know understanding what it is and therefore they come into to problems when they're trying to understand how variables are changed or whatever um, later on but having that box analogy that you can constantly refer back to as you get into more complex things um, is really really um, is really really helpful um, another thing that I um, found helpful uh, was um, nested for loops. So nested for loops uh, it are, are really uh, tricky to get your head around when you first come across them. Um, and when I was thinking about a couple of years ago, thinking about how I might teach it, um, I um, had been doing some stuff with some electronics and I suddenly remembered that um, we have these uh, old fashioned clocks here and I'm gonna start the animation. I don't know if my sound comes through for my system or not. I apologize if it suddenly becomes very loud. Um, but what I do is I play this um, to the pupils. There we go, let's pause that. And so what we've got is the two loops. So we've got the um, the loop on the left, which is an eight currently. And what's quite nice about that is, is we can have a discussion about whether that's a loop of 12 or a loop of 24, because it depends what clock it is. And then we've got the loop on the right, which is always um, 60. And what I found is that just that if they write a simple program to um, uh, spit out to output the the numbers at the right time so that you, you you output a load of ones and then it goes from zero to 59 then a load of twos going from zero to 59 again and um, they can actually do that quite quite readily using um, nested for loops and then what is nice again is that when they come into a nested for loop in a more complex situation so maybe looking at two arrays or or lists or, or something like that uh, and all of a sudden it's it, it's a lot more difficult to understand you can draw them back to the clock and, they, and you can say, how did you solve that? And then, okay, so what is the hours in this and what is the minutes? And by doing that, they're able to do it and it gives them that hook that they can um, look back on. Um, oh, golly, I've only got about four or five minutes left, right? Okay. Um, so uh, just very, very quickly then, um, I'll go on to, uh, I, I often talk for too long, I do apologize. Uh, just something thinking about this in terms of talking about repetition um, and uh, this is a, a, a picture that I uh, stole from um, one of the Raspberry Pi um, pedagogy quick reads that, that you can have a look at and that's thinking about semantic waves and the, semantic waves and the idea that um, you can have um, 
uh, if you start you got complex ideas and you can bring them down into very simple ideas so algorithms into recipes but the bit that you need to do is to bring it back up um, to the abstract and complex meanings and importantly I think bring it up to new um, applications so that they're constantly able to refer back to um, those um, ideas. Right, um, I will actually whip through the next few slides um, reasonably quickly then. So uh, this is something that I used the Raspberry Pi Sense Hat uh, to do uh, something with uh, year nines. And so they've got, um, this is a list here that lights up the pixels. And then what I do um, is I give them a, a loop and um, I say, this is how it works. We get it, get it working. And then I ask them to um, change the color, create a top right and bottom left and by copying and pasting and changing things and changing the main program so that quadrants light up in a, in a sequence and change the delay to see what happens. So they're experimenting with it um, and seeing what happens. And they very quickly work out um, most pupils, no matter what their ability can, can usually do um, something like this. Um, I then move on. So we uh, use the joystick and we've got some if um, statements here and we're also using um, display image, which is slightly different because you can import PNG files. Um, this is the first task that I do ask them and pretty much everybody can do this relatively quickly as well. And it's brilliant because they're clearly understanding what's going on. Um, and then I give them a task. So we've got to write a program that runs an animation in a loop on the LED matrix and they need to design five images. Um, and they can either use a grid or use a GIMP, which works on the Raspberry Pis. And then they need to create the code that displays the images in an animation um, in a continuous loop. I give them this code. I ask them to do it. These are the important bits and pupils struggle because it looked like they could, they understood what was going on here and they understood what was going on here. But I think what they are actually doing is just modifying what went on here and what went on here, a bit like you might change settings um, on something um, and actually putting the two things together was really, really difficult for them. And that's a good thing, but something that you'd expect to happen relatively easily didn't. And I think this is why thinking very carefully about the uh, Sue Sentences Prim model is really, really important, particularly um, these two um, sections here, the modifying and the making, and making sure that there is absolutely time to make as well as just modify and really understanding the difference um, between the two. I won't go into that into detail. Um, you're probably aware and you can have a look um, at that as well. One final thing, um, which I hope is giving me enough time, um, is this idea here. So I started off with um, Python, uh, sorry, with Scratch, that pe pupils can often do things very, very quickly and easily in Scratch. So um, something like this, most pupils in year seven could do quite easily. If you then told them how to do if statements in Python and asked them to do it in Python, um, they would actually find it not, the, the same number wouldn't be able to just do it straight away. It, it's much more um, difficult. And I think the difference is that in Scratch, you're looking for things that work in Python, you've got to actually type it. And just to illustrate this, um, I've got a blank screen. I'm going to show you three pictures. And what I want you to do is out loud, because nobody's listening, um, can you say the words on the pictures, not the pictures themselves? Now, actually, I think it depends how close you are to the screen, but you will probably find that pants and giraffe are quite hard to say because there's a very different um, thing. Oh, I've done it the wrong way around. I meant to say the pictures, not the words, because I'm rushing at the end. Um, I've done that the wrong way around. So the idea is to say the pictures rather than the words. And what you actually find is that you can't help read the words. And this is something called automaticity, because reading is something that you automatically do. You can't, um, you can't forget, um, and it really gets in the way. And that's great when you're reading, it's not so great if you're doing a problem like this, but if we can bring automaticity into our writing of programming in the same way, um, then that is going to take away that, um, that extra layer and make it much more easy to access the, um, the problems that we're doing. Right, I think I've finished with one minute um, to spare. I'm so sorry I rushed through um, the end there. Um, so I don't know if there are any questions um, that I can very, very quickly do in one minute. Um, Tim, I don't know if you've got anything for me. I have a couple of questions. I just want oh, to say thank life. you. 
I, I wish we could give you more time because I was I'm so I was, sorry. <laughs> I was really, really fascinating, and um, I've taken away a lot of extra reading um, around this whole logical thinking. The, 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 sort of the more academic stuff really fascinates me, so I'm certainly going to take away a, um, a bunch of reading recommendations. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Uh, two quick questions because um, that's all I've got time for. So apologies Sorry. if I don't answer all the questions. Um, uh, someone's asked for um, to what extent your school is attempting to apply this um, understanding in, in a learning context. How much do you apply it in the your everyday school existence, as it were? Well, as a school or me, um, I mean, it, that's an that's an interesting question. Um, so, as a school, we are we are very uh, interested in this. I think what what is it. What is problematic in the same way that I was struggling with working out what does knowledge mean in mathematical context or programming context? It, it's the difficulty of, of how to apply it. But I think that we are, um, because we are very aware and through the school um, talking about these kind of ideas um, relatively regularly um, in training sessions, it's a slow process, but people are starting to look at their curriculum um areas and and uh, and do it and actually the the school closures i think have been in, in one way have been absolutely fantastic because people have had to think so very very carefully about how they're able to get um things across and actually what is helpful in doing that uh, when a teacher isn't present so uh, all the time but it's a very long process brilliant thank you um uh, one question, or it's more of a request. Um, someone's asking for a repeat of the DeGroot study conclusion. Is that something that can be done in 30 seconds? Um, so th the basic takeaway was that um, expertise um, allows people to uh, solve problems or recall memory quicker in situations um, that require the expertise, but in random situations, um, that seem to be um, so for the for the for the expert chess players, a random chess board is no easier than for a novice chess player. If you're an expert chess player, you can recall a board much more successfully and quicker than a novice chess player if it's an actual game position because it it you're using your expertise and your knowledge of chess positions, uh, game positions to do that. Great. I hope, um, I hope that's the. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to do a quick two for one on the automaticity stuff. Um, yeah. So one person has asked how it applies to programming. Another person is wondering how it could work with dyslexic students. Has there been any research on it? Okay, uh, the dyslexic one, I'm afraid I have no idea. That's a really good question. It's something worth looking at, I think. Um, so I, I'm afraid I don't know. Um, the I was hoping to highlight that in, in something like Scratch, where you're dragging across, where you're saying, okay, I need to do... I need to do a selection. I can't quite remember what it is, but I'm going to click on the menu and I'm going to find something and work it. Um, you know, and I know that with my own son, who's actually a very poor reader, but he's incredibly proficient at um, using Scratch. He's able to find the blocks, and I don't know whether he recognises the shapes and knows what it does or whatever. In Python, you know, you've got a blank page. It's very scary, um, and if you can um, actually be able to just simply write an if statement without thinking about it then you're not thinking about how do I write an if statement, you're thinking about what do I need to do? Um, and I think I've, certainly with GCSE students, because we just, in the UK, we just don't have enough time um, lower down the school um, to, to do things. But when you've got them for, um, you know, three days a week or whatever, there is definitely a point where all of a sudden they're starting to think about the problem instead of trying to remember how to actually write the code. And that's, that's you know, and if we can understand that, you know, where that comes from, um, and if we can encourage repetition, and it's difficult because how do you encourage repetition without a feeling you're boring the pupils, um, then I think that's really, uh, that's really important. But also understanding, you know, that it's not that necessarily they don't understand the problem, it's that they can't write it in Python. And actually that feels to us as experts like a really odd problem but actually it's normal and natural and we just need to overcome that. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, final question, a request. Um, will, um, can, can we or I share the presentation slides with people after the event? You're very welcome to. I think some of the, yes, because you've got it. I think some of the notes don't necessarily make sense because I took them from other things, but uh, I'm absolutely happy for that, yeah. Cool, I'll, I'll consult with you after for that. Um, right, okay. <laughs> 
These sessions, uh, as the person has just asked, these sessions are being recorded and they will be available after the CAS Virtual Showcase is finished, probably next week. So watch this space on that. Um, Lee, thank you so much. Um, You're very welcome. For those of you uh, who are uh, attending for the first time, when I close the webinar, you will get a survey and please do take your time to uh, give us your opinions on the session. And also, you, again, if you have tweets, please do send them using the hashtag CASVirtual20. Um, lunch break now, after lunch, two o'clock, um, we've got Will Rogers who uh, and Will Rogers doing a session and Steve Clark doing a session on NCCE. Um, so check out the uh, brochure and the agenda for all of that stuff. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming along today. Thank you, Lee. And thank I you. look forward to seeing you. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you all at the next webinar. Cheers. Bye-bye.